Good afternoon and Happy New Year from Heirloom Books at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jeff Helgeson and to start off 2024 like Julian Fellow's follow-up to the wildly popular British television series Dalton Abbey, I've decided to look back to a pair of American authors who, although having eventually become close personal friends, wrote their respective and highly popular literary fiction chiefly about the gilded age of the late 19th century, primarily from perspectives developed upon opposite sides of the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, of course, Henry James and Edith Wharton. Both born in New York City, although about 18 years apart, respectively in 1843 and 1862, according to um, Eleanor Dwight in her illustrated biography of Wharton, the two novelists first met at a dinner party in Paris during the late 1880s, and then again several years later in Venice. On each of these occasions, it seems that James' young female admirer made little or no impression upon him. Wharton once commenting about their second meeting that the well-established Mr. James neither noticed the hat that she had selected to gain his attention, nor its wearer, and the second meeting fell as flat as had the first. It wasn't until after the publication of a volume of short stories and a novel titled The Valley of Decision in 1902, set in Italy, as had been James' first full-length work, that the expatriate American author wrote to Wharton advising her, Do New York! Two years later, in London, the pair of writers met again subsequently establishing a close relationship that lasted until Henry James' death in 1916, following an apparent stroke. By the time Henry and Edith became personal friends, James had already published most of his major works, including The American, Daisy Miller, Washington Square, The Portrait of a Lady, The Wings of the Dove, and The Turn of the Screw, a gothic story about the governess of two children in an English country estate that is haunted by a pair of ghosts. Wharton, by contrast, at this time, had only published a small collection of verses, a non-fiction work called The Decoration of Houses, a novella titled The Touchstone, and The Valley of Decision. But, according to Eleanor Dwight, when Edith told her new friend Henry that she planned to buy an expensive automobile with the proceeds from the Valley of Decision, James replied that, with what he had received for the wings of the dove, he planned to purchase a small go-kart or hand barrel on which to wheel his guest's luggage from the train station to his home adding that with the proceeds of his next novel, he'd plan to have the cart painted. The difference in these two writers' economic situations seems to have reflected a lifelong set of circumstances. Although, having each been born in the area of New York City adjacent to Washington Square, and both spending much of their youths in Europe while receiving private educations, Henry James had not come from the same old money New York society as had Edith Newbold Jones, whose married name became Morton. Henry James, the younger brother of um, William James, the philosopher, most noted to me at any rate for his work, The Varieties of Religious Experience, was well off. But Edith Jones Wharton was rich and very well connected, a born member of New York City's 400 socially prominent individuals, 
as allegedly determined by the uh, number of guests who could be accommodated within the ballroom of the Astor Mansion on Fifth Avenue, now the site of the Empire State Building. Continuing with a general pattern of similarities as well as distinct differences, both James and Wharton primarily wrote their fictions about the time following the Civil War in the United States, which Mark Twain in his first novel had termed the Gilded Age, primarily the 1870s through the beginning of the 20th century. Following James' advice, however, Wharton did chiefly do New York, while Henry James primarily dealt with the cultural issues confronting Americans to uh, do Europe while being deceived, manipulated, and taken advantage of by the old world aristocratic class, <coughs> the majority of whom had fallen upon distressed economic circumstances that they often sought to redress through the exploitation of naive, wealthy, new world innocents abroad. Another general set of similarities within the work of James and Wharton were the common themes of money, marriage, and morals, or a highly evident lack of them. For example, Henry James' third novel, The American, first published in serial form within the Atlantic Monthly beginning in 1876 and then as a book the following year, related the experiences of a self-made American businessman named Christopher, like Columbus, Newman, on his first excursion throughout Europe, who becomes enamored with the attractive widow of a duke who had essentially been sold into wedlock through a family arranged marriage, and Newman's attempts to win her affection, which were blocked by the beautiful woman's mother and older brother, ultimately leading her to become a Carmelite nun and making Newman a sadder but wiser victim of old world aristocratic values. By contrast, Edith Wharton's most successful novel, The House of Mirth, taking its title from the Old Testament biblical text of Ecclesiastics, verse 7, line 4, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, <coughs> but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. The book earned as much as a million dollars in today's money at the time of its initial publication, and it relates the story of an orphaned American heiress named Lily Barth, who descends from a life of social privilege to one of isolation and impoverishment, ultimately demonstrating the lack of moral standards among Mrs. Astor's 400 cultural elites. In what was one of Henry James' most acclaimed novels, The Portrait of a Lady, written in the early 1880s, a high-spirited American orphan named Isabel Archer comes into a fortune thanks to an inheritance from an English uncle the largely estranged husband of the maternal aunt who had brought Isabel to Europe in the first place, and is then exploited by a pair of one-time lovers in order to secure a dowry for their illegitimate daughter, both denying Isabel her freedom and exploiting her fortune through a deceptive marriage that she becomes incapable of escaping. Within the book, the prime manipulator, Madame Merrill, on one occasion shares the highly valuable insight that within a marriage, a person takes on much more than one other individual and, for better or worse, assumes a relationship with everyone else associated with his or her spouse. Later in the novel, 
one night beside a dwindling fire, Isabel has the extended opportunity to think through the implications of that truth, as well as the myriad ways in which it, it had come to very specifically impact her life. Back in the good old U.S. of A., within Edith Wharton's 1921 Pulitzer Prize winning book, The Age of Innocence, a man named Newland Archer, relationship to Henry James Isabel, apparently in name only, is planning to marry May Welland, but becomes distressed by the presence of her scandalous cousin, Countess Elaine Alaska, Alenska, the estranged wife of a Polish nobleman, although later falling in love with the disgraced Countess himself, yet still marrying and having children with May, even after suggesting to Olenska that they should run away together, a notion which the Countess rejects, as a result of having been told by her cousin that she and Newland were going to have a child without really having had that pregnancy confirmed. Decades later, on her deathbed, May tells her oldest son that he and his siblings should always trust their father because of the great personal sacrifice that he had made for the sake of his family. Then, given the chance of seeing Countess Alenska once again, Newland declines and elects to remain a lonely widower for the remaining years of his life. The stories of both Isabel and Newland Archer, of course, have each been adapted to major motion pictures. Portrait of a Lady in 1996 featuring Nicole Kidman, Barbara Hershey, and John Malkovich. The film received two Academy Award nominations. Three years earlier, Martin Scorsese had, di had directed Daniel Day-Lewis, Michelle Pfeiffer, Winona Ryder, and Miriam Margolis in an adaptation of The Age of Innocence that earned $34 million in profits after production expenses and received five Academy Award nominations, winning Best Costume Design and Best Supporting Actress for Miriam Margolis. With Henry James moving his locale to um, America and the Europeans facing extreme economic difficulties, an artist and his sister, who is estranged from her Polish nobleman husband, come to Boston and visit their cousins, the Wentworths, who invite the two of them to stay in a small cottage owned by the family. The sister, Eugenia, has in her possession a document which, by signing, will effectively dissolve her marriage to the Eastern European nobleman, and both she and her brother become interested in a pair of prospective American matrimonial relationships that are complicated by multiple circumstances, while also offering the prospect of significant financial gain. The artist, Felix, becomes attached to his cousin Gertrude, but her family wishes her to marry a local minister. Eugenia sets her sights on a wealthy bachelor named Robert Acton. While Felix succeeds in becoming engaged to Gertrude, the two of them arranging that the minister marry her younger sister as well as perform their own wedding ceremony, Eugenia takes on the role of mentoring the Wentworths' younger son, Clifford, who has been expelled from Harvard for excessive drinking. This ultimately leads to a misunderstanding when Mr. Acton suggests a romantic visit to Niagara Falls, but then discovers Clifton in the cottage, and Eugenia lies to him about the presence of the young man, causing both suspicion 
and estrangement, ending the prospect of her gaining a wealthy husband through her trip to the United States and causing her to return to Europe without even waiting to attend her brother's wedding to their American cousin. Like Henry James' change of locale for the Europeans, in 1911, Edith Wharton shifted her focus away from wealthy New York society with the publication of a novel entitled Ethan Fromm. In it, what Wharton essentially offers up is the backstory of an impoverished, physically injured small town Massachusetts man, Ethan Fromm, and his love affair with the cousin of his chronically ill wife eventually resulting in a suicide pact that causes Fromm's injury and paralyzes his lover from the neck down, leaving his wife as their primary caretaker, the three of them becoming forced to live together in a triangle that prefigures the ending of French existentialist philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre's Hell as Other People stage play, No Exit. Also, exploring the themes of marriage and adultery, um, Henry James' novel, The Golden Bowl, set in England and published seven years before Ethan Fromm, <coughs> deals with the complex relationship of an American father and daughter, their respective marriages to a pair of former lovers, and hidden imperfection within their relationships, as represented by a concealed flaw within a golden bowl that had been considered and rejected as a potential wedding gift, the novel ending with the separation of the lovers when the father and his wife are encouraged by his daughter to return to America, the other couple remaining on the opposite side of the Atlantic Ocean, and the secret flaw within the apparently unblemished set of their relationships remaining undisclosed. In keeping with the theme of maintaining appearances regardless of any potential challenge to propriety, both Henry James and Edith Wharton managed to sustain relatively respectable public images throughout their lives. According to Wikipedia, James proclaimed himself a bachelor, and although it's been speculated that he may have been in love with his cousin, Mary Temple, a neurotic fear of sex kept him from admitting such affections. It's also been observed that the celibacy as a once familiar paradigm in the biographies of homosexuals when direct evidence was non-existent. Wharton, in her autobiography, A Backward Glance, <coughs> dedicates a full chapter to Henry James and only mentions her husband, Edward, once within the book. Also excluded is her protracted love affair with Morton Fullerton, who Eleanor Dwight describes as an intelligent but not very nice man, a relationship that Dwight says over a period of a few years worked its way from rapture to disappointment. According to J.B. Priestley in Literature and Western Man, what Henry James contributed to the world was the notion that a work of fiction should be a work of art, as a sonata or a painted landscape is a work of art, and that the novelist's artist should be consciously moralistic, directing the reader through his imagination to draw certain conclusions critical of man's behavior in society and belonging ultimately to the sphere of values. Edith Wharton, the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction in 1920 for the Age of Innocence, and a three-time nominated 
um, person for the Nobel Prize of Literature, also was made a chevalier of the French League of Honor established for establishing work rooms for unemployed women during the First World War, in addition to organizing concerts to support the war effort and founding tuberculosis hospitals while also designing lavish homes and gardens in the United States and Europe, Wharton chronicled the Belle Epoch at the end of the 19th century, as well as having served as a frontline World War I war correspondent. Together, Henry James and Edith Wharton left a vibrant literary record of the society and the times within which they lived. Their works have inspired as many as 26 film adaptations, and even the end of Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris, about the nostalgia of having missed being part of the lost generation of the Roaring Twenties, ends with that era's representatives regretting not having been able to have participated in the period of cultural history that Henry James and Edith Wharton preserved within their work. I'm Jeff Helgeson. Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois.